so to conclude this chapter, I want to emphasize that our laws are created to help promote a peaceful society and social justice. The idea of justice is fairness, integrity, impartiality, and even-handedness. At the same time, the laws appear to operate to promote certain groups' interests over others. Certain groups are safer in our social world, and others are more at risk for violence or arrest by law enforcement. Our justice system seems to have some biases built into it, and dismantling them will take efforts on all people's parts. There is gender disparity in intimate violence as well. Most intimate violence is males assaulting females, and the majority of times females know the attacker. A RAND study estimates 63% of the time the victim knows the attacker. I want you to understand that rape is not just a crime about sex. It's to some extent a way of maintaining social control and male dominance. It's not just the act that is at issue. It's the threat of the act that maintains social control. An example of this is men that don't have to worry about walking across campus alone. Women think of this all the time. So to what extent females internalize this message that to be alone in an open space is dangerous? And to what extent does this message play out in other aspects of life? That one needs to be in the company of others to be safe. So that is what I mean when I say that the threat of rape is a manner of social control. Women also have a much higher likelihood of victimization from domestic violence than men and suffer much more extensive injuries if there is a serious assault. The World Health Organization states that the greatest threat to women's health is in their own homes. The National Violence Against Women survey found that out of 16,000 women and men surveyed, 25% of women and 7.6% of men stated they had been raped or physically assaulted by a partner, spouse, or date at one point in their life. So intimate partner violence is very prevalent and again, the idea that women are injured and victimized by violence, that violence tends to be inflicted on them by someone they not only know, but someone that is close to them. The economic cost of violence in our society is borne not only by victims, but society as a whole. The cost of violence to society is high. Direct costs include medical and mental health care, and the indirect costs include lost productivity and time away from work. When people have to take time off due to injuries, doctor's appointments, or for counseling services, it costs society in lost productivity. And women who experience severe forms of abuse are more likely to lose their jobs or to be on public assistance. The cost of violence is high enough that the federal government sponsored joint studies with the Surgeon General in 1998 to help understand and establish the cost to society for violence.